Hi everyone, welcome to our roundtable, Digitizing Food in the Book. Um, as a reminder, we will not be reading bios today, um, just to leave more time for discussion at the end. Um, however, the bios are available at the conference website, a link to which is provided in the chat at the bottom of your screen. Our five roundtable participants will each speak for about five minutes and then we'll have a discussion afterwards. So please add any questions that you have in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We're gonna start off with a video contribution from Barbara Wheaton on her Sifter digital resource. Okay, please let me know if you have any troubles hearing. Hello, I'm Barbara Wheaton, and I'd like to tell you something about my project, which I'm calling The Sifter. Let me start by thanking Alan Griego for inviting me to be part of this wonderful virtual gathering. The Sifter is a finding aid and a searchable database. It is free to all registered users. And like Wikipedia, the data contained in the Sifter will be contributed and edited by registered users. I began reading really old cookbooks back in the 1960s as I read my way through Harvard's remarkable collection of very early cookbooks. I began to realize that I needed a system that would allow me to look at both the small bits of information in the recipes and the bigger, often less explicit statements about health, class, and lifestyles. It became impossible for me to keep the information in these books both in my head and separate from each other. I had to devise a system to record the distinct details each book each recipe contained in such a way that I could reference them for comparison at a later date. I had been an art history graduate student at Harvard and studied with the great Jakob Rosenberg, who made the point that you should look at all aspects of a work of art, its place in the artist's oeuvre, the techniques, the iconography, and its life after it left the studio. If you didn't have this information, you could not have a full view of the work of art. It is Jakob Rosenberg's method that I came to use in looking at cookbooks. Who wrote it? Who bought it? Who would use it? When would it become too old fashioned to be practical? Are there ownership marks, book plates, comments on specific recipes, grease spots? Cookbooks live dangerously. What were the specific significant political and societal events happening in the time and place where the book was written. Wars, plagues, famine, cast long shadows. Are there movements of recipes within the European world? When is tradition valued over originality or the other way around? What other books existed at the same time and were they similar? Can we track new world foods moving differently into various parts of Europe? This is all information that can reveal much about the recipes. What makes the sifter different from other research tools is the, the ability of the user to add all the minutiae of a work, a cookbook, for example, to the database and then compare it to what else exists in that database, including multiple editions of the most popular books. Context is everything. The sifter is just in its early stages, so there are not yet huge amounts of data in it, but it is gaining steam. In the two months since it, well, its launch, we have required 4,500 registered users, and some of them have begun to contribute. A contributor begins by entering the author, the title of the book, the sections, recipes, and then the items. The granular details, which include ingredients, actions like sift and bake, and materials, whether wax paper or cotton. The items list contains at present about 2,600 of the most common words associated with cooking. Although this meticulous data entry sounds like a ridiculous amount of work, the rewards are significant. In the near future, with the addition of data visualization cap capabilities to the sifter, it will become possible to track ingredients as they move around the world or even disappear, and to track the introduction and history of a method as well as origins of recipes, religious practices that came and went, the beliefs about nutrition and the medicinal properties of foods and techniques. Accuracy will be critical in a project like this because it creates the baseline against which everything is refracted. If the data input is not accurate, the results will be misleading. At the virtual Oxford Symposium on Food and 
cookery conference in July, we had the good fortune of being offered 5,000 early German and French books and manuscripts and recipe collections that have been parsed for another amazing project called Corima, a project you will be hearing about. In the near future, optical character recognition will be accurate enough for us to start scraping books that have already been digitized. This will speed up the process considerably. I would encourage you to poke around the sifter and try adding some data, see where there is a void and fill it. This is not the first time in history that facts have been in dispute. Now, however, we have the technology to compare across languages and time to get closer to seeing an accurate picture of what actually happened than what is pure fantasy. Okay, so our next presenters will be Bruno LaRue and Helmut Kluke, who will jointly present on uh, their digital work. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, we have a sh uh, first, please forgive me for my poor accent in English. Uh, second, we have decided with Helmut to, to, sh to cut the presentation in two parts. Uh, the first part is a general uh, part on the research question, in, in fact, uh, that uh, Corema uh, uh, raises in, in that case. And uh, the second part is uh, more precise uh, and uh, it will be Helmut who will speak and better than me, of course. Uh, maybe I can, we can go to the second dia. Thank you. In fact, if we, if we want to understand the, the reason of, uh, uh, the reason why Korema was developed, was begun to be developed, we, we must go back to the 80s, in fact. During the 80s, uh, the research on food history was concentrated on um, uh, uh, a social and economic approach. And in, in fact, during the 80s, the perspectives changed completely and we began to work on a cultural approach. And in that case, uh, with the cultural approach, the importance of uh, cookbooks is really uh, a major fact. In fact, uh, cookbooks, we find them during all the history of Western uh, food, from the Roman period to until now, and even from the Greek period, but particularly in Middle Ages, where suddenly we discovered during the 80s the existence of more than 150 uh, manuscripts book manuscripts and with many many informations how can we tr treat this information how can we do statistics and we can how can we do comparisons between uh, for example French uh, uh, German uh, English cookery through the uh, cookbooks. It was a question in the 80s and in that time we have already the material, nearly all the material, but we had not the capacity to do it by uh, electronic uh, tools and uh, it was a problem. We tried to do that but in fact, we couldn't uh, succeed. So I'm very happy that now we can do it. This is one reason um, why I'm very, very enthusiastic about Corema. I hope it will uh, uh, give some results, very enthusiastic, I'm, I'm really sure. But this is the, the, the main reason for me. So thousands of recipes, have been preserved in those medieval manuscripts. If we try to think about 
not only the number of manuscripts, but the number of recipes, of course, it seems that the task is more, more important even. Can you show the next dias? So this is the location now of known manuscripts. Manuscript from uh, Middle Ages, from Middle Ages cookery, from medieval cookery. And of course, location now and origin during the Middle Ages are not exactly the same, but mainly it's concordant. So it's very interesting first to realize that cookbooks were copied all around Europe and also that cookbooks were copied from the, the 12th century to the 15th century. This is a war material, in fact. So 12th century, it's a manuscript in Latin that we discovered, I say we, they, they, that means the research community discover recently uh, in England. Next, please. Until now, we have, in fact, research on English recipes, research on French recipes, on German recipes, but separate. The thousands of recipes that have been preserved in medieval manuscript, in fact, need to be studied on the European scale. And we decided to uh, study first the manuscripts in German, French, and Latin. Please, the next one. How many recipes? We don't know yet how many recipes are, are concerned. We can make an evaluation, in fact. We realize that approximately um, um, there is 100 recipes by cookbooks. We have, on the European scale, more than 160 recipes, uh, rec cookbooks, sorry. So that means there is something like 16,000 recipes. This is an estimation, huh? it's not real, uh, real uh, uh, statistics. On this so many uh, recipes, uh, we can study in German, French and Latin manuscripts one, uh, eight, sorry, 8,060, 600, sorry, recipes. This is the middle, huh? it's for 50% for, uh, of the total. So it can be useful first to begin with French, Latin and German manuscripts. Please the next one. Our hypothesis, it's very clear. We try to do a multilingual analysis because we think we can find information about migrations of texts, migrations also of tastes, and also the different habits that have built food identities and food heritage of Europe. So it's on the medieval period, but it tries to imagine that uh, the information can be useful for a uh, general history or general study of food identities in Europe. The methodology is very clear, of course. First, we have to transcribe the text. Most of texts have been edited, but sometimes 
poorly edited. So we need to do a new editions for some of them. And also there is some text, some manuscripts which were never edited. So first we have to transcribe the, the text and secondly to uh, try to modelize the informations, codicological, philological, historical, that need to be linked with uh, uh, this uh, manuscript. Of course, uh, according to TIA uh, international standards. First, to study the information, second or third, I don't know, uh, we have to uh, build some ontologies concerning ingredients and culinary process. And it's a very difficult task, in fact, because uh, there's many words which, in fact, were never clearly defined by um, uh, linguists, and we need to do a big research on this point of view. Third point, we integrate this information to a data platform. And after we have the visualization of spatial repartition and of evolution, what we need, what we want to reach. And if we have time, we can do also critical editions online uh, with a philological uh, side. Next, uh, next Daya, please. Uh, Bruno, you have about one minute left. Yeah, this is the last one, I think. Huh? Uh, to, to, we, we, we want to produce a generical model, not only for medieval time, for middle ages, but also for other periods and other parts than Europe. And we want also to sensibilize a large public to the importance of history for understanding our food habits. And I must say that uh, when I speak about this project uh, with a large public, to a large public, they are very enthusiastic. Okay, you can have some more information on the blog, on the YouTube channel that we uh, also built and uh, on the research website, which is now uh, on construction. And maybe the, the last, uh, the, the next uh, dias are just the, the, the way, the link to go to see this uh, realization. I, la I let the, to Helmut, please. Helmut. Yes, thank you. You go on. Thank you. I was too long as usual. So well, I'm very short. <laughs> so uh, this is a quick glance at uh, the science blog, but I want to talk about uh, the data platform. Yeah. Uh, research and data of the Corima project are available online in our repository. The website and our approach towards the historical texts are based on the methods used for digital scholarly editions. Digital scholarly editions aim at presenting results that surpass the possibilities offered by the book. They are determined by a digital paradigm. For the Corima project, this paradigm starts with the base data. The source files for all derivatives of our work are TI XML files that describe the historical source as detailed as possible. We are aiming at a very close textual reproduction of the historic document. The initial transcription is produced manually with the software Transcribus. Derivates of our base file are, for example, the text image, image synopsis or the different downloadable versions of the source text. These include the XML file with the hyperdiplomatic data, the XSL transformation files, or the source as a plain text file. For all historical sources, detailed bibliographic and codicological metadata is available. 
our institutional repository uh, also provides a detailed metadata overview. The data on the website is available through an intuitive and differentiated user interface that allows for an analytic approach, but it also supports uh, curiosity-driven research. Another derivative of our base XML file is the semantically enriched text. The common denominator between the different language texts are ingredients, tools, and dishes. In the end, these will be the basis for a cross-language recipe comparison. The annotation of the text relies on a semi-automatic workflow with Python scripts and comprehensive variant lexica. We aim at gold standard data quality. The Corima semantic model is designed to be used on any cooking recipe, either old or new. The data graph shown here can be translated into TEI XML as well as RDF XML, which is used to store our data in an appropriate triple store database. This data structure allows us to connect our data, ingredients, dishes, and tools with data from the linked open data universe. For this link, we rely on the community-driven Wikidata knowledge base as an intermediary. This structure also allows us to analyze the data with semantic queries, which can provide us with associative and contextual information. An example would be our flavor data experiment. For this, we enriched our ingredients with information on flavor molecules, providing both numeral as well as textual information. With the appropriate queries, we got flavor profiles for individual recipes. Here, for example, for a tasty mustard recipe. We associated flavor with the humoral qualities of the ingredients. And now we have information on how the individual humors would taste today. We can even use this information as a means to provide a distinct reading, a distant reading approach towards our recipe collections. What I have learned from the work with our team so far is that any meaningful and forward-looking research into historical sources on food and food waste has to be digital. The digital medium brings unknown potential and a highly to a highly interesting field of study. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bruno and Helmut. We're going to turn it over to Hillary now. Um, so help me if you can, right, perfect. Hillary, you can connect your screen now. Okay. Hi everyone, and <laughs> thank you all um, for inviting me to be part of this amazing conference. Um, there's so much to say, and as usual, not enough time to say it, so I'll try to be um, quick and clear. Um, so, um, first I want to say um, that, to remind everyone, because you may know this already, maybe you don't, um, what the Early Modern Recipe Online Collective's mission is. Um, our goal is to include scholars, students, and the general public in the preservation and transcription of texts written in English, recipe texts, um, written between 1550 and 1800. And there are a lot of them. Um, I wish we had the precise counts um, that other presenters have had. Um, the idea is to make these searchable in a way that is useful to not only scholars, but the general public. Um, we started this effort in 2012, um, and at the time we were based at the University of Saskatchewan, thanks to one of our founding members, Lisa Smith. Um, but of course, um, things have changed since then. Um, we have developed a number of academic library connections. We began, our first text to work on was actually a welcome library text. Um, but since then, um, we have established connections with places like the Newberry, the Clark, and the University of Pennsylvania libraries. Um, but the Folger has been um, an incredibly um, important part of our efforts, especially since the beginning of um, their offering of the Dromeo interface. Um, so their help with transcription um, and their offering of so many recipe texts for us to concentrate on has been foundational to the project. Um, so 
much of this struck home for me, um, this idea of um, the ways that our alliances and collaborations have been important um, struck home at the Food and the Book Conference Transcribe-a-thon while I was doing this particular recipe, uh, which I commented upon as we were actually working it um, with it, um, to make a swan's pudding. Um, and it's, a, it's one of those traditionally um, you know, strange recipes where you are putting lots of things um, inside of a, a unexpected container. Um, in this case, the swan. Um, and one of the ways that this is described is through the, the phrase mingle all together. And it became clear to me that this is exactly what Amarok has been working on for so long. Um, and this was not only the case because of this recipe, but because of the fact that I was transcribing this recipe um, remotely, um, working with a conference based in Chicago at the Newberry, but in a transcribathon led by Heather Wolf from the Folger at the Washington DC on a manuscript from England, digitized and residing somewhere in the Washington DC area that nobody was quite, or I'm not quite sure um, where it is given the Folger remodel. So the geographical scale um, is re requiring and allowing for a lot of collaboration. Um, and it's allowing recipe books from remote places to come into the lives and the actual studies of people all over the world. And the kinds of interactions we get to have with them are um, certainly rich now, thanks to the, trans the transcribathon methods, um, but also the results are going to be available to so many more people as a result of this. Uh, this, by the way, is the Dromeo interface, if you have not seen it, um, where you type all of your um, transcriptions into the little green box, which is usually bigger um, when you are actually working on your own text. And you can see there the tags that are available to be applied by people who haven't transcribed before. Um, so it is a very user-friendly way of getting people um, who otherwise don't have a lot of time working with these sorts of texts, a lot of experience to actually produce transcriptions. And that kind of transcription is, um, that kind of crowdsourcing is key to what is um, MROC's mission. We want to bring people in from all walks of life. And in fact, the kinds of people who come to our Transcribathon um, are often very unexpected. We've had people come in from four different continents at this point, um, and we have certainly had people ranging from high school students to retirees um, getting involved, um, which is a really wonderful thing to do. Um, when we do these transcriptions, we usually have people from multiple campuses, and the idea is to triple key each of the texts. Okay. And I do want to say that the Folger docents are doing so much of this too, which makes it really wonderful. Um, so in mingling all of these things together, um, MROC is creating a virtual community um, that is dedicated to making these recipes accessible, um, showing the students and the public alike um, what makes them so interesting. Um, here, for example, is the recipe book of Constance Hall, which was the subject of one of our transcribathons, where she is doing a lot of mingling just on one page. Um, so now that it's searchable, this text is indeed searchable, thanks to um, the Folgers' efforts to vet and put them on to Luna, um, you can find all of these examples of where the phrase mingle all together come, uh, comes into play, not only in Hall, but across the selection of different recipe books. Here, by the way, are a bunch of transcribers mingling all together as they work on the Constance Hall book. Okay, and um, I wanna say too that MROC has done a lot of work um, showing people and encouraging others to share the ways that transcription has been a part of their classrooms. Um, that here you can see how Liza Blake um, is talking on our blog about transcription as a part of experiential learning, something that is emphasized on a lot of different campuses. And um, Ian McInnes, um, or, and at Albion College said it very well, and he was very happy to share um, his materials for transcription as well. So you can get these on the blog if you're interested. Um, he is talking about how wonderful this is as an experience for students who don't realize that collaboration can be a part of the way that research in the humanities comes into play and is more and more today. Um, participating in NROC's, NROC's 
Hemrock's Transcribathon, um, early in his course, he says, helped convince students that collaboration is valued among serious scholars in the humanities. Most of his students, of course, were thinking that it was much more of a thing um, in science. Um, and so here, the the involvement they had in the production of an actual scholarly resource showed them something that they hadn't realized before um, and allowed them to be contributors. Here, by the way, is what they are contributing to. Um, this is the way that um, the transcriptions are appearing in Luna right now. So you can see that they appear next to the page imagery and underneath the transcription is actually credit for all those who have contributed, um, not by name yet, but by group. And so that is something that is incredibly important to us to make sure that people are recognized for the work that they do. Okay, and the last thing I want to say is that um, MROC is going to be uh, continuing to create new collaborations. Um, I'm happy to say that um, in the spring of 2021, um, we will be hosting a transcribathon that is working with texts from the Royal College of Physicians and from the Wellcome Library. We're going to be doing both texts on one day to promote comparisons among different library holdings. Um, and so this is going to be a, a new experience for us. Um, and we hope we can make it through both of these texts on one day. Um, and they will be using Drobio. If you are interested in being part of it, we would certainly like to hear from you. So thank you so much. Um, I'm sure there'll be more questions as a result of this um, presentation and I will be happy to hear them. So please do get in touch if you're interested in taking part. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hillary. I'm already excited about your double transcribe-a-thon and I will be there. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Elisa, too, who's done many of these things to help us out and make it all work. So thank you. <laughs> um, so our last presenter is Christian Reynolds, who's going to be talking about his digital project. Right, thank you very much. I'll just start up sharing my screen. It seems I can't share my video for some reason. So give me one second just to get my screen up and running. So hi, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? I should just double check that first. Yes, we can. Wonderful. OK. Um, hi, my name is uh, Christian Reynolds. I'm from the Centre for Food Policy at City University of London. Thank you all for sticking around for the end of this. Um, I'm here today to talk about the AHRC U US UK Food Digital Scholarship Network. Sadly, it doesn't have a good acronym like every uh, the other uh, three on the talk today. Um, and this was a uh, brief networking uh, project that ran over the last year and has been extended due to COVID, um, uh, meaning that we couldn't have our final wrap up activity. So we'll be moving a couple of them online. But the main focus of this network was to increase the use of digital scholarship methods across um, humanities research and trying to form some other collaborations and broader. And it was to uh, run some small pilot projects uh, around some small cultural, well, with cultural organizations and also scholars. Um, and so there were two main things that we did within this time is that we uh, won some money and were able to fund some pilot activities within uh, digitization and exploring uh, food um, digital archives. And also we ran some surveys, both of the uh, community, the digital uh, research community, and also of the archives themselves, just to understand what are some key common challenges for digital food research. And knowing I've only got four minutes left, I'll quickly go into those different challenges. But we had a lot of different people interacting with this project over the last year. So thank you much, very much to everybody for being interacting and thank you for inviting me to speak here. And so the pilot activities focused on a couple of different aspects. Um, firstly, there was a uh, work stream which was digitizing community collections and so the University of Southern Mississippi and the University of Leeds um, went from first principles and started digitizing community cookbook collections with printed and uh, manuscripts, well handwritten I should say, so more modern cooking collections and looking at the experiences and um, how you digitize them from the ground up and uh, writing some manuals for other collections to do the same. Um, then there was also activity looking at searching for text and materials within established collections and so there is a brilliant uh, white paper um, now at that DOI which chronicles the experience of some gastronomy students and uh, the uh, gastronomy staff at Boston University um, looking at the Smithsonian API catalog and how you would approach this amazing search database at the Smithsonian. However, 
all the metadata at each of the Smithsonian institutions and the search corpuses are different. So how do you as a food scholar start approaching that? And at the University of Edinburgh, likewise, they started looking at how you access food related information in sound archives. So whether that be song or oral transcripts, et cetera, and how do you link those to on the page based um, information, be that recipes or other food based texts um, within uh, Edinburgh based archives. We also were able to provide some money for the SIFTA and that was amazing to see the SIFTA now online. Um, We've also had discussions how to link with, via IIIF and different data spaces, transcription tools, et cetera. And it's been brilliant to talk to both Welcome and Folger about potentially how do you get these different uh, catalogues to be talking at the same time. And finally, we've been looking at using um, AI and natural language processing techniques on recipes um, to pilot different ideas. And I'd love to talk to the other two presenters after this about this and also other people. So linking through to nutrition or environmental impact databases. So we could actually start understanding the historical nutritional profiles or um, other things regarding this, uh, regarding historic recipes or even our contemporary recipes if within copyright. Um, so the two big things we, we did uh, was a survey which uh, was answered by uh, 200 people from uh, around the world and I've uh, written a post on the recipes project blog there I encourage you to go and look at that and we also have the archive survey which was answered by 45 digital and, um, content and physical archives globally. Um, 40 to 50 percent of or uh, 40 percent of the community survey was based in the US with 50 percent of the archive survey. Spookily 28 percent of both the UK our community and archive survey was responded there with others from Canada, Australia, New Zealand and also non-English speaking um, backgrounds within that um, though they, they were in lesser. But what I would like to say around this is from both the archive and the community su uh, survey is that there was a wide age a wide age, age, sorry, of both archives and community members who are using the text or publishing and digitizing the text. And that means there's a very wide range of technical readiness with some archives and, archi and people accessing it having um, proficiency or not having materials yet ready and uh, digitized, which means there's a lot of needs and wants. And I think the way we can easily summarize that is digitization expands the table. You can have people in other countries start engaging with texts which were never available to them. And I think the two previous presenters show that amazingly well, but it also comes with unique challenges. So I thought I would leave you and just say that our, our, our kind of network has been focusing on manuscripts as well as printed documents, as well as images and sound and 3D scans of food related materials and how do you get those into interacting um, and how do you start interacting with them and the big challenges here are funding where do you get money to start doing this research this interdisciplinary or innovative research but also where do you get funding to start digitizing the things that are unavailable and from the archive survey it showed that there is so much still undigitized and we need to start thinking as a community how do we actually help archives strategically identify what they need to digitize and I think the, these two surveys were done pre-COVID and since March since not being able to access the physical medium anymore it's just showing how much more valuable this is but we also need to start having a uh, discussion within our community and within the archives and together about how we link and search together if full optical character recognition is needed of the text. So the, having we've I've had long discussions with Welcome because they've gone in and only optical character recognized the titles of all the dishes in the books because that was a much faster way through. But again, these are problems for now, but in three or four or maybe five years, the, these will start becoming a much more networked, pro, uh, networked and uh, linked issues. But we need to start having these, these discussions. But I think this entire conference has been brilliant because it's established and normalized these new methods of um, digital research, how we access, how we talk about this. So thank you for letting me invite, but there's some definite challenges ahead. But I think as a community, we can start solving them. So thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure talking. Thank you so much, Christian. That's really great context for all of our um, for all of the different projects we'll be talking about. Um, Hillary, Helmut, Bruno, if you wanna unmute yourselves and uh, get your cameras going, we can all appear on the screen and have a discussion now. Uh, I really like the idea of uh, starting where Christian ended, which is this uh, problem of the challenges. We actually, this ties into a question that Hillary, you received from an anonymous uh, participant who asks, how does one control for accuracy and quality in a transcribathon? 
but I think that really this is a broader question for all of you about the problems with digital data um, across languages or across projects. Um, so Hillary, maybe you can start since that question was directed at you. Sure. Um, we control by having someone vet the transcriptions on the other side. And Elisa's smiling because she's been that person. Um, and I'm, I think several of you um, in the audience may have been. Um, I see Amy's also asked a question, and I know she is um, someone who has spent time vetting and training others to vet. Um, this is indeed labor intensive, um, but yes, um, but it is far more effective than OCR with manuscripts because even if OCR does find its way into um, handwriting um, in a way that is workable for other texts with um, manu manuscript recipe books, it would take more doing um, because there are various hands in each book um, and all the hands are peculiar in their own way. Um, so so the training of the OCR in that case would be quite labor intensive and would require vetting just as transcription does. Thanks, Hillary. Um, Christian, do you want to take over? <laughs> um, so I, 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 my only context in this is having run some small things on Zooniverse as part of a crowdsourcing uh, material. And that was you had, again, the individual researcher at the back end having to try to look at that. But I think the method the Folger has uh, with Luna is quite advanced. So maybe somebody or uh, would like to speak about that. I'm not sure. Yeah, I can just say on the Folger's end, um, after vetting, we go through many other stages, um, which I'm involved in. And it is quite labor intensive um, and errors still slip through. So um, that's sort of the nature of it. Like there, there are always data issues. Um, these are challenging documents to work with. Uh, Pre-modern um, and manuscript materials aren't um, very well, uh, they're not necessarily uh, suited to digital technologies yet. Helmet and Bruno, do you wanna say anything about that? Well, I just can um, support Hillary when she says uh, transcribing is labor intensive. So uh, the question should be, uh, what goal do you want to reach? Do you really want to have the whole text transcribed uh, as, as we do? Uh, or or uh, is it enough if you have uh, the recipe titles and the ingredients? And for the last part, uh, the, the transcribal software, for example, uh, offers very good uh, uh, HTR models for for different scripts. So it uh, could be a, a way to speed things up. And things are getting better by the month. That is true. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, another question directed at um, Helmet and Bruno that's asking if, uh, so this one's from Amy Tigner and she says, thanks for the wonderful presentations about these digital projects. I wonder if there are plans for digitizing Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, or manuscripts from other European countries. Mm -hmm. I, I can, I can try to answer. This is, this is the aim, in fact, but uh, in the, in the, in the project now, we have just uh, funds to <laughs> to to work on the French, uh, Latin, and and Austrian, but uh, uh, German manuscripts. But we we have partners, usual partners in the in Europe, in Italy, in England, and and they 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 really wait uh, that uh, we, with the result of Corema we can begin. Uh, an enlarged uh, project, that means a European project. I didn't discuss it with Helmut, sorry, for the <laughs> before before our meeting, but I'm sure we we agree on this on this perspective. But first, people needs to to people need to to know what what we have done and the result. And I must tell you that next spring, spring 2021, we'll organize a symposium uh, online on the subject of the recipe. And uh, we, we, of course, we will write to you, to everyone in this, in this, uh, in this um, conference to, to maybe if they are interested to, to present the, the, 
the project. I am very interested in the in the participative side, for example, the the the, the participative labor is very interesting. Mm -hmm. For me, it's maybe it's a solution. I mean, for many many uh, um, uh, cookbooks, uh, your your. Oh, Hilary, your your sorry, I ask a question. Uh, Hilary, uh, you are limited to manuscript, no, uh, yes. no, yes. no, no printed book. Yes, that's correct. And yeah. How many? How many? Sorry, you maybe you you told you say that, but I didn't uh, hear correctly. Uh, how many manuscripts you you are in your, your project? Well, we we um, are. Um, at the moment, there are dozens that are searchable, um, yeah. Yeah. and so there are there there are more and more appearing every day for us to transcribe. Though <laughs> um, there there will never be done. <laughs> okay, so it can be uh, hundreds of uh, yes, manuscripts. definitely. Mm -hmm. So okay, I don't know if I uh, answered the question, but. It's okay. Maybe if I just add, add one more sentence, uh, our data model is so open uh, that uh, if, if people use our data model, the data can be uh, added to our repository mm -hmm. and, and all research uh, and all visualization will be available for this data, provided people use the data model. Um, so a follow-up question, um, somewhat related. This is from Martha Carlin. She asks, uh, Bruno Hellman, Hillary, do um, your respective projects make it possible to trace the history of individual recipes over time and across languages and regions? Yeah, surely, yes. It can, it, it, it can give new lights on this uh, story of one recipe, yeah, of course. That's certainly so with MROC, though most of what we've transcribed is in English um, and from sources that can be linked to um, English compilers. Um, so it, it's very difficult to trace a recipe across time, though, given our texts are often not dated in a way that's very precise. Um, so a lot of that does involve the user's interpretation as opposed to an instant answer. Um, but the projects are certainly um, there to be done. Um, on that question. Yeah, the, the goal of the Corima project is to exactly answer this question. Uh, I'm not sure if we can really answer it with the data we have because uh, as Hillary said for her, for her uh, stuff, uh, we don't have exact dates and regions. So we can only uh, attempt an approximation. But uh, the research methods we apply in, in, in uh, our uh, repository are aimed at answering this question. So we have a question from Peter Hertzman. Um, he says, being able to search the text is great, but many times I need a high resolution image of the text. Is there a way to attach these images to the databases? Christian? Um, so I, I think Helmut can probably also chip in here, but I think one of the main things that would be good for us as a group to move towards or when talking to archives is uh, the IIIF, the interoperable image framework, which means you can actually start moving images from one database to another and understanding the rights issues behind there. But um, I think that that's getting very, very technical. Um, but I would also just add on to that previous question, just saying that the SIFTA, please register and play with it because you can start tracing um, from within early modern to, to contemporary sources and tracing recipe development or tracing techniques and ingredients, which together might form a, a recipe. So a cake with a melt-in method might be that you could start tracing and seeing how recipes start forming if you then do on those sorts of cross searches, which is the curiosity driven, which I think um, Helmut's database also has that capability. Yeah, that's hugely exciting. Um, another question for you, Christian, uh, which technologies and technical formats do you think would lead to more connected food data? Which skills do we need to train new staff who are coming in? Mm -hmm. 
that that's that's part of the the kicker i think and that's within the community survey it really showed there was a lot of different skill sets a lot of different knowledge levels and some people just want to be able to use a piece of software such as the sifter such as just a search engine and find specific text and just use text or just be able to grab images other people want to do a lot more complicated things coding in languages to start capturing and transforming the text and so uh, there's not one simple answer for that um, but being able to if you're wanting to get into this learning to do some code uh, uh, is a very very handy thing but there's a lot of different formats and it depends if you're an archivist versus a researcher i think in terms of what the skill sets are there um, but uh, that's a very uh, I, i'm aware of the time so i won't go any longer on that <laughs> i think we can go a few minutes over since we're the last session of the day but yeah we um do, uh, do any of the rest of you want to comment on what skill sets you think m might be most useful right now? Well, I, I think it's not about skill sets. It's it's about uh, the the general will to uh, share data people are producing. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the most important thing at the moment. And this is not uh, the role of the people who are doing the work, but this is the role of, of uh, the institutions the people work for. It's mm -hmm. this, it, it, it relates to the, the question on high, res high resolution images, which was uh, uh, the last one. Uh, it's the same there. Uh, it's, it's the job of, of uh, archives and libraries to share those images. Yeah, I'll just add that at least in Canada, governmental funding now, um, if you get, if you, if your project is supported by government funding, you have to make the data publicly available. It is a condition mm -hmm. of that grant now. So that is interesting in terms of how that will lead to better access um, in data across projects. Okay, so we have a question from Kathleen Lynch. And the question is for Hillary. And she says, the English manuscripts worked with the MROC tend to come from the context of a household. Can you tell us about medieval examples and other contexts? Um, well, I don't know that, that that's really for me, um, since we're not dealing with medieval so much. So, um, so uh, or uh, are there Helmet or Bruno, do you have something to, to add to that? What, what is a household context? I, I don't understand exactly. You mean family context? Or? Yeah, I think um, they're, they're generally, the ones that at least we have at the folder generally are produced within the context of a family and shared mm -hmm. sometimes across generations yeah. um, and are written into the Oh, it's not exactly the case in the medieval uh, context, in fact. It can be, but uh, not uh, always. There is also a court, court uh, context, courtly context, mm -hmm. which is uh, important in a local medical context. So there can be different, different, uh, different uh, context for the, for the, for the medieval manuscript, medieval cookery manuscript. But what is interesting, I mean, I think, if I, if I can say something about uh, the modern period, is the coexistence of um, printed books and uh, manuscript books. And the comparison between these two materials is very interesting, I think. And uh, if we can uh, use a digitized uh, material, maybe we can have a beginning of, a, of an answer of why uh, in, the, in the period where printed books were very uh, numerous and there, there were so many cookery books uh, printed, why uh, we, uh, people go to use uh, manuscript? This is an interesting question and there is no answer for the moment, no clear answer. Mm -hmm. If I can suggest. <laughs> Uh, Christian, we have a question for you from Geor Georgiana Seigler. Uh, she asks, is there a URL um, for a website that gathers the information from your research at these multiple institutions? So uh, the community survey uh, information 
is there's a good blog post for the recipe project, but for everything else at the moment, ahrcfoodnetwork.ac.uk. Um, I'll post it in the the chat after this if the admins allow me. But um, the the archive survey we're formatting and it should be out before Christmas, COVID willing. Perfect. Look forward to that. <laughs> Um, a question for Helmut, and I'm very interested in this actually too. Um, can you tell us more about the taste query experiment? Um, could anyone use your database to run a similar search? Um, well, as, as the slides showed, it was an experimental approach. Uh, and the, the problem with the approach is uh, that we're lacking data. So, uh, of course, uh, information on, on uh, flavor molecules of, of ingredients are online in databases, but uh, what, what we wanted was a result that uh, gives us some insight into the recipes. So we needed uh, this uh, molecule data structured. And for this, we used uh, a book by Thomas Wilgis, uh, who came up with uh, those uh, nine flavor groups. Uh, and, and uh, uh, concentrating on, on the main flavor of ingredients, on the flavor which you actually can taste as a human. And so uh, going, uh, coming from that, we uh, only have, had limited information. We had uh, information on uh, herbs and spices and on some uh, vegetables. So we what we can do is we can look with this limited data on the manuscripts. It's not uh, the 100% the picture we get, but we get information. So uh, for example, the uh, uh, distant reading approach towards, uh, uh, towards the manuscript collections. What, what I realized when looking at those is that we, have, we had two manuscripts, one from a monastery context, one from a courtly context. Uh, and it was interesting to see that the monastery context did not have uh, ingredients uh, that, that go into the uh, onion flavor group. So there, was, there actually was no ingredient like uh, um, onion or, or uh, stuff like that. Hmm. That's fascinating. Um, we have another question from Martha Carlin, and she asks Bruno, Helma, and Hillary, do your projects include any information on the actual use by cooks of the recipes or just the textual transmission of the recipes? So what can we learn about the use of manuscripts through? Uh, yeah, it, it's a, I, I think it's a big question, but uh, there's maybe it's not this kind of data that can answer to this question. In fact, uh, we know that uh, some cooks uh, created cookbooks, but we don't know very well if they use it. <laughs> you know what I mean? In fact, the creation of, uh, of, uh, of a cookery text is a, is a kind of uh, Re written, written act to some formulas uh, which are transmitted through orals, uh, gestures, and so on. And uh, maybe the cook can act in this particular process, but we don't know if they really read the book they are supposed to create. This is my opinion. <laughs> Found it, I, I, I knew a little bit uh, medieval manuscripts and uh, worked on that. And if the question is, uh, can we find some, oh, I would say dots of grease on the, on the manuscript and they imagine that they can be used in the, in the cook, in the kitchen, I think it's, it's, it's impossible for the moment to to have the to have the answer. I don't know if I was very clear on this answer. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Um, with 
the Emrock books, we know with many of them that they were used um, because there are notes from the cooks in the book. Um, Martha, for example, has just asked, are there comments like very good and less salt? And sometimes the answer, yes, there are those comments. There's also probatum est written in, um, and whether or not that's actually proven by the person who owns, owns the book is the other question. We don't know that for sure. But we do know that there are many um, emendations and oftentimes people will scratch through recipes and say things like this one is no good. <laughs> so that's a very helpful um, bit of information and that is recorded in the transcriptions okay. when a recipe is, is crossed out. So, sorry, I, I just uh, understood maybe wrongly that it was only, uh, the question was only on the professional cooks, but of course with family cooks it's, uh, it's obvious that they were used. And uh, clear. There are family cook, family recipes that you can't tell whether were used or not because people can sometimes have you know six different recipes for one thing and you can't use six at one time. Yeah. So just oh, but, to follow up on the medieval side, uh, in in the German tradition we have uh, sixty recipe collections, and not one of those has um, any traces of use which would uh, go back into the kitchen. So uh, I think the actual using of, of recipe collection uh, comes uh, past 1500. Hmm. Um, so we have one final question, which is a good uh, question for all of you, which will help wrap up our panel. So Lucy Hadford says, thank you all for some fascinating talks. I'm looking forward to the transcribathon already. Um, I appreciate that online transcriptions and digitized forms of recipe books are very useful, especially during this pandemic. But do you think there's a danger that by concentrating on digitized forms, we might forget to look at the manuscripts in the flesh and uh, so might neglect marks of use, for instance, um, and other features? I would answer that um, by saying that uh, there's always that there, there will always be something that is missed um, in a digital representation of a manuscript that these are, are tools um, that can substitute but should not be considered substitutions for the actual manuscripts. Um, but considering that access is such a barrier, um, they are certainly you know, important to have. And the kinds of interactions that transcription allows a person to have, and in fact demands a person to have um, with a manuscript, can yield things that wouldn't otherwise be um, apparent to a user. Um, that there are actually some things that are easier to see and appreciate in a digital manuscript uh, or digital transcription or image. Um, and I do think, I just want to go back and say, um, at least with many of the MROC texts, you do see some of the physicality of the text in new ways. Um, you see stains, um, you see things sewn in um, that you can examine really closely in, in that sort of a con it, that arena, um, in a digital arena that you might not be able to do so easily in the flesh. So. Um, do any of the three of you have any concluding thoughts on the benefits or trade-offs of the digital versus the physical? <laughs> okay, Christian, you want to say something? <laughs> Well, I was just going to say, I think the physicality of recipe books, of cook f food texts, and the quality of the, the material, etc., all goes into analysis. But uh, as Elisa said, the barriers to actually accessing this, and people in any country now can access an online text, be able to actually engage with it, is such a revolutionary thing. And I also think it's worth thinking about the access to... Um, audio to visual or even 3D imaging of those books and, and texts and, and other materials such as cookery equipment from those eras that can actually be used to transport and engage and you could not have that to the numbers of people without digitizing and that's the real powerful thing I think and be able to link those things. Yes, to be able to put a cookbook from say the welcome next to one held at the Clark, um, that's not possible <laughs> without this kind of a project. Uh, Helmut and Bruno, do you have any final thoughts? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think both, both approaches, if I understood co correctly, uh, are necessary for the, for the 
especially for the for really the <coughs> specialist in fact uh, who needs to to see the manuscript because even with a digitized form very very good uh, there's things that you see only if you see the manuscript by itself but I think for most of people it's not necessary. This is an answer. I don't know if it's a good answer, but yeah, I, I just want to uh, support this because so so my opinion is that in the end uh, the digital medium wins. Of course. <laughs> yeah, no, that was the conclusion of your presentation. <laughs> Make it digital. Um, I think more than ever. Everyone in the audience appreciates the work that you're doing on your digital projects. So thank you for that work and for joining us in this roundtable. Um, so everyone is applauding for you <laughs> in, in the background. Um, uh, and to everyone who's listening, don't forget that our final uh, public program is on Monday. So please join us for that. Thank you for listening in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.